Welcome everybody. My name is Dr. Silkman and I'm from the Foul Play team. It's good to be back. And today what I'm going to be going over is Stephen Avery's 2003 exoneration DNA reports. Now we all know the very sad story of Stephen Avery and we know that in 1985 he was sent to prison for 32 years for a brutal crime that he never committed and in 2003 he was exonerated. Now it was through the use of uh, DNA technology which had freed Stephen Avery and it was all done by Cherie Colhane. Now the reason why this is so interesting of course it's because of Cherie Colhane's hair analysis in 1985 that sent Stephen Avery to prison and ironically enough it was Cherie Colhane's pubic hair analysis in 2003 which led to the exoneration of Stephen Avery but this time she used DNA technology. So what we're going to do today is we're going to have a look at the 2003 exoneration DNA reports. So here is, I'm going to go through it step by step. And I want to say from the outset that these documents uh, were obtained by FOIA and they're also paid for by foul play. So um, members of our team uh, went out and forwarded these documents. So let's go through it step by step. So first of all, let's have a look at the date of this report, September the 4th, 2003 and the submitting agency in this particular case was the Honourable Fred Hazelwood. Now the reason why this is so interesting of course was that uh, Judge Hazelwood had denied Stephen Avery's freedom in 1996. Uh, there was some DNA analysis that was done back in 1996 but unfortunately Judge Hazelwood was not convinced of the results and as a result of that Stephen Avery went back to prison uh, in 1996. Now this case of course uh, revolves around uh, Penny Bernstein and this poor lady uh, unfortunate lady was uh, viciously attacked and sexually assaulted back in 1985 and Stephen Avery was charged uh, with that attack and we know of course that he never was anywhere near Penny Bernstein. Now, the DNA analysis uh, was done by Cherie Colhane and she's from the Wisconsin State Crime Laboratory. Now, I'll read it out. The following items of evidence were resubmitted and examined for the suitability of deoxyribonucleic acid DNA typing in accordance with a court order filed September the 16th, 2002 by University of Wisconsin Innocent Project. And you can see uh, the front page or part of the front page of the court order. And this court order, uh, we'll examine that later on. This court order was uh, filed by uh, Honorable Fred Hazelwood. Now, down below you can see the items that Cherie Colhane had examined. First of all, it was item C, one through five. These were hairs recovered from paper hospital sheets. Now, if you could remember what had happened was um, Penny Bernstein was taken to uh, one of the local hospitals uh, and uh, she stood on um, uh, hospital sheets, paper sheets, and basically brushed hairs from her body and those hairs were collected on these hospital sheets. There was item D10. This was a pubic hair combings uh, belonging to Penny Bernstein. Item D13, which were fingernail scrapings. These were from Penny Bernstein. And item F, one through two, and these were hairs recovered from a brown shirt. 
And here are the results of that analysis. And I'll read it out. One apparent pubic hair, item C5, and one apparent head hair, item C3, reportedly recovered from the paper sheets were re-examined microscopically and found to be unsuitable for possible DNA typing. These hairs were referred to in the court order as trial exhibit 38. So these hair samples were unsuitable for DNA typing. Basically, you can have a hair, but if it doesn't have a hair root, you can't extract DNA from it. Next paragraph. One apparent head hair, item F2, reportedly recovered from a brown shirt, was re-examined microscopically and found to be unsuitable for possible DNA typing. This hair was referred to in the court order as trial exhibit 31. So again, this head hair that was from the brown shirt, presumably Stephen Avery's brown shirt, was unsuitable for DNA typing. Next paragraph, and this is the important one. 13 apparent pubic hairs were recovered from the pubic hair combings, item D10, reportedly collected from Penny Bernstein. These hairs were re-examined microscopically and 11 of these hairs were determined to be suitable for possible DNA typing. These hairs were referred to in the court order as Trial Exhibit 38. Detectable amounts of DNA were present on two of these 11 hairs. So from the uh, originally from the 13 pubic hairs, uh, it went down to 11 and only two of those 11 apparent pubic hairs were suitable for DNA typing, just the two. Final paragraph, fingernail scrapings, item D13, reportedly collected from Penny Bernstein, contain only one small fingernail clipping from the left hand. This small clipping was extracted for DNA typing. This clipping was referred to in the court order as Trial Exhibit 38. So, DNA was extracted from fingernail clippings. Now, once the DNA was extracted um, from the pubic hairs and the fingernail clippings, uh, the following took place, and I'll read it out. The DNA detected from the two hairs in the pubic combings, item D10, and the extraction from the fingernail clippings, item D13, was amplified using the polymerase chain reaction, PCR, method, and type 415 short tandem repeat, STR, genetic markers, as well as the gender marker, amelogenin. And down below, you can see in the table, are the STR loci that would have been typed. Uh, and uh, Sheree Cohen had used the Promega PowerPlex 16 amplification kit. So you can see the genetic markers that were typed and right down below is the gender marker amelogenin. So essentially with the amelogenin, um, when the DNA typing is done, if a, a double X chromosome comes up, it means that the sample is from a female. If X and Y comes up in the sample, then it's from a male uh, individual. I'll read out the results, and this is very important. The DNA profile generated from one of the apparent pubic hairs in D10, D10A, was consistent with having originated from a female individual. The DNA profile generated from the remaining hair in D10, D10B was consistent with having originated from a male individual. This profile occurs in approximately one person in 251 billion in the Caucasian population, one person in 162 billion in the African-American population, 
one person in one trillion uh, it should be in the uh, southeast hispanic population and one person in 49 trillion in the southwest hispanic population these statistics were based on a population database of unrelated individuals obtained from the federal bureau of investigation the fbi now note the following this profile was entered into the combined dna index system codis and searched against local and state databases this search resulted in a match with a convicted offender in the convict, in convicted offender index of the Wisconsin DNA data bank. Now this is very interesting. So what we've got here is the following. DNA 10A was from a female individual. DNA 10B was from a male individual. So DNA 10B, who did that come from? So what Cherie Cohane did was she placed DNA 10B, the DNA 10B DNA profile was directly entered into CODIS. A match was obtained. And here are the results of that um, uh, computer search. And I'll read it out. The personal information on record in the data bank unit related to the matching offender profile is listed below and lo and behold who comes up gregory a allen and uh, here's a photograph of uh, gregory allen's arrest record he was arrested in 1995 so why is this significant well it's significant for many many reasons one of them of course was that Stephen Avery in 1985 uh, was sent in prison for 32 years for the attack and brutal sexual assault on Penny Bernston. At the same time, while Stephen Avery was in prison, uh, Gregory Allen was free uh, to roam the streets for the next 10 years. And it's known that Gregory Allen uh, committed at least two more sex related crimes all because of the fact that Stephen Avery was in prison for a crime that he didn't commit so the computer data bank search had picked out Gregory Allen so I continue with the results this match should be considered an investigative lead any further interpretations will require the submission of appropriate standards blood sample or buccal cells and finally the dna typing results from the fingernail clippings item d13 indicated that the dna originated from a female individual no further information can be ascertained from these results and this is actually quite surprising um, we know who the victim was, it was Penny Bernston. So it's actually quite interesting that Cherie Cohane uh, did not determine uh, who that female individual was. Now, we know at the time that this um, exoneration DNA results were done, uh, Gregory Allen was convicted of a separate rape in 1995 in Green Bay, Wisconsin and he had received a 60 year prison sentence. Now, what is very, very interesting here is that Gregory Allen has never been convicted nor charged for the Penny Bernston sexual assault. And this is rather puzzling because a pubic hair belonging to Gregory Allen was found obviously in the pubic hair region of the victim, Penny Bernston. So it's rather bizarre that Gregory Allen has not been charged uh, for that sexual assault on Penny Bernston. Now, this is very, very interesting because the uh, database search had picked out Gregory Allen. So the question that I would like to know is, 
when was Gregory Allen's STR genomic DNA profile submitted to CODIS? So he was arrested in 1995 and he would have been he would have uh, given uh, uh, or taken a DNA sample from him uh, and uh, PCR analysis would have been done and uh, his genomic DNA profile would have been submitted to CODIS. So it'd be very interesting to see uh, the documentation of exactly when that took place. All right, and here is a recent picture of Gregory Allen. Um, uh, this was taken in 2015. Now, much to my surprise and shock, uh, his uh, a parole uh, uh, hearing is actually due in 2021. So he hasn't obviously served his 60 years, but uh, he's got a parole uh, meeting next year. Uh, let's hope he remains in prison and serves out the entire 60 years. All right, now this is where things start to get really, really weird. So we know that with the previous report, uh, Sharik Cohen had extracted DNA uh, from two pubic hairs, uh, one belonging to a female and one belonging to a male. Uh, that um, pubic hair belonging to a male was from Gregory Allen. But we've got this very, very curious report known as a supplemental report. Now, notice the date. The date of this report is September the 10th, 2003. The DNA analysis uh, was done by Sheree Cohane, and I'll read out the results of the supplemental report. And it says, a buccal oral swab, item W, reportedly collected from Stephen A. Avery, was submitted for comparison to a DNA profile previously generated from an apparent pubic hair item D10B collected from the pubic hair combings item D10 of Penny Bernston. See laboratory report number M851051 issued September the 4th, 2003. That's the report I've just gone through. The profile generated from the buckle swab item W reportedly collected from Stephen A. Avery is not consistent with the profile from the question pubic hair item 10b and the conclusion is Stephen A. Avery is eliminated as a possible source of the DNA from the pubic hair item 10b and evidence disposition or items will be returned to the submitting agency. Now, this is rather bizarre for a multitude of reasons, and I'll go through them in a second. So here's the actual uh, report uh, that contains item W, and item W contains one sealed envelope containing buckle swab standards reportedly recovered from Stephen Avery. And have a look at the date, the 9th of September, 2003. So it's pretty obvious here that a buckle swab was obtained from um, Stephen Avery for DNA analysis. Okay, so what Cherie Cohane would have done uh, was extracted genomic DNA from uh, item W, which was the buckle swab from Stephen Avery, and she would have obtained a full STR genomic DNA profile of Stephen Avery. However, there are issues with this, and I'll read it out. Cherie Cohane had the STR genomic DNA profile of Stephen Avery, which she had obtained from item W. Now, this is bizarre because despite placing D10B, which was the STR genomic DNA obtained from the apparent male pubic hair, and that pubic hair was from the pubic combing of Penny Bernstein into CODIS, right? Which we read from the previous report. 
the match encoders of Gregory Allen had effectively eliminated Stephen Avery as a suspect in the 1985 sexual assault, right? So it wasn't his pubic hair that was present in the pubic hair combing from Penny Bernston. That pubic hair was Gregory Allen's. So in actual fact, there was no need to obtain item W from Stephen Avery and compare it to D10B. We already know who D10B belongs to. It belongs to Gregory Allen. Now, we need to have a look at this uh, court order very, very carefully. And there's some shenanigans which are going on here. Now, this court order was filed on September the 16th, 2002. Uh, and it was written up by Honorable Fred Hazelwood. And it's important to read it out. And I'll read it. Based on Stephen Avery's motion for post-conviction DNA testing, oral arguments heard on March the 22nd, 2002, and evidence presented at the hearing, it is ordered that Stephen Avery's motion for post-conviction DNA testing is granted. The following evidence shall be released for DNA testing pursuant to Wisconsin Statute Section 974.07. Now, look at these items that the judge wants tested. Now, these items on the left-hand side are what Cherie Colhane uh, had written down in her previous report. So, head item number one, head hair identified by the state at trial as microscopically consistent with that of the victim. And that was referred to as F2. Point number two, unknown pubic hair and also unknown head hair uh, and these were known as items c1 through to c5 number four pubic combings and these were referred to as item d10 point number five fingernail scrape, uh, scrapings and these were referred to as item d13 but take note of the last one, item six. Comparison standard samples of victims' head hair and pubic hair and Stephen Avery's head hair and pubic hair. And these were referred to as D12, D11 and A. I continue. Based on the party's agreement on April 10, 2002, it is hereby ordered, one, the clerk of Corks of Manitowoc County shall seal the above listed evidence and release it to a sheriff's deputy. Note the following. The sheriff's deputy shall transport the evidence while maintaining the chain of custody to the Wisconsin State Crime Laboratory located at 4706 University Avenue, Madison, Wisconsin. And of course, that's where Cherie Cohane worked. Point number three, the State Crime Lab shall accept the evidence and shall, now check this out, Judge Hazelwood specifically told the, the Wisconsin State Crime Laboratory exactly what needed to be done. And I'll read it out. A, examine the head hair found to be microscopically similar to Penny Bernston to determine whether PCR, STR can be performed to obtain a DNA profile from the hair. Point number one, if PCR, STR DNA testing can yield a DNA profile, the crime lab shall conduct such test. Furthermore, the lab shall conduct such test on Penny Bernstein standard samples. So we know that those samples come from Penny 
Bernstein herself and will give her DNA profile. The crime lab shall compare the profiles to determine whether the hairs have matching DNA profiles. Now, I won't read out point two. Basically, what happened in point two was, was that if Cherie Cohane was unsuccessful in obtaining DNA, the samples were to go to another laboratory for mitochondrial DNA testing. So the pressure was on Cohane to get the results from the samples. Point B, this is very important. While the crime lab is following the procedures set forth in paragraph A, the crime lab shall examine the remaining evidence, specifically the unknown pubic hair, the unknown head hair, the pubic combings, and the fingernail scrapings to determine whether PCR, STR testing can be conducted to yield a DNA profile. Point number one. If such testing can be performed, the crime lab shall conduct PCR STR testing and compare results to DNA profiles in the State Crime Lab Data Bank and the National Data Bank CODIS to determine whether any profiles extracted from the evidence match a profile from the data bank. And we saw that in Cherie Cohane's first report. Point two, if PCR STR testing yields DNA profiles in one or more of the above items of evidence, the crime lab shall compare such profiles, now note, to the standard samples item six. And if we have a look on the left hand side, item six is D12, 11, and also A. Now these samples were standard samples. And I continue to determine whether there is a match. Also, the crime lab shall compare such profiles with any other profiles found in one or more of the above items of evidence. In addition, the crime lab shall contact the parties and await further instructions as to how to proceed with such evidence. Point number four, after testing is completed, the crime lab and or mitotyping technologies shall send the results to the court, attorney Wendy Paul and district attorney James Fitzgerald. Point number five, in the event that there is remaining evidence after testing is completed, the crime lab and or mitotyping technologies will return this evidence to the clerk of courts of Manitowoc County in order for it to be preserved. Dated this 16th day of September, 2002. So we can see on the right hand side here, uh, the exhibits and I'll read it out. These items in this envelope to be sent to the Wisconsin State Crime Lab for further testing as agreed to by the parties and as ordered by the court. So you can see here that this package contained item A, item D12, item D11, and all of these items were the comparison standard samples. Now they were all included in the package that was sent to uh, the Wisconsin State Crime Lab. Now, what is interesting here is the following. In the original court order, there was no buckle swab, item W, that was required from Stephen Avery. Stephen Avery had provided both head and pubic hair samples so that DNA could be extracted from them and used as comparison standards as was outlined in the original court order. Now, this is interesting. So once the evidence was uh, examined and processed, uh, the evidence had to go back 
to the Manitowoc County Sheriff's Office. And what we note here is that this evidence that was returned back contained D11, D12, and now this W, uh, sorry, this V is likely item A because it contains one sealed plastic bag containing standard hair sample collected from Stephen Avery. But what you notice is that we have a new item here, item W. And item W is a one sealed envelope containing buckle swab standards reportedly recovered from Stephen Avery. And as we've seen, the judge never asked for Stephen Avery to provide a buckle swab. So the upshot of all this is as follows. Sharie Cohane did not use item D11, D12 and A as part of the exoneration analysis. Now we know that and the reason why we know that is that Sharie Cohane was not able to determine um, the, who, who the female was um, who provided the pubic hair and also the fingernail scrapings. Now, had Sharie Cohane actually isolated DNA from D11, D12 and A, she could have easily determined that the DNA, the female that had left the pubic hair sample and the fingernail scrapings was none other than Penny Bernstein herself. But clearly in the report, it says unknown. Now, what Sharie Cohane used instead was item W, which was the buckle swab. So Sharie Cohane used the buckle swab to isolate Stephen Avery's genomic DNA. And then uh, item W was returned, as we can see in the form on the left hand side. So the question is this, why did Sharie Cohane deviate from what Judge Hazelwood had requested? Clearly in the documentation provided by the judge, there was no need for Stephen to provide any sample uh, like a buckle swab. He had already provided standard samples um, in the original request. So let's summarize the 2003 exoneration DNA reports because they're very, very interesting. First of all, D10B, which was the STR genomic DNA profile that was obtained from the apparent male pubic hair of the combing that was submitted directly to CODIS. A match was obtained in CODIS, Gregory Allen, and he was already in prison for, an, for a 1995 rape. So therefore, the state or Sharie Cohane at the time already knew that the uh, DNA profile from the pubic hair, D10B, belonged to Gregory Allen and not Stephen Avery. Honourable Fred Hazelwood did not authorise the taking and use of a buckle swab, item W, from Stephen Avery. It wasn't necessary. He had provided the standard samples that were required to do all the analysis in the crime laboratory. Now, Colhane did not use item D11, 12 and A. These were the so-called comparison standards as she was actually requested to do by the judge Hazelwood. There was actually no need to extract DNA from item W as Colhane had already obtained a match, Gregory Allen, in CODIS for D10B. In my opinion, now I'm only speculating here, I believe that there can only be one reason why Colhane had extracted DNA from item W, and that was to upload Stephen Avery's STR genomic DNA profile into CODIS despite Stephen being exonerated for the brutal sexual assault of Penny Bernstein in 1985. Now you've got to remember, Stephen Avery wasn't arrested in 2003. He was arrested in 1985. 
Stephen was exonerated in 2003. Now, this actually explained why Sharif Cohen got a match, Stephen Avery, in CODIS in 2005. And I believe the reason why is because his DNA genomic profile was uploaded by Sharif Cohen in 2003. So, why didn't the Wisconsin State Crime Lab destroy item W? Right? It clearly was not part of the original um, filing as required by Judge Hazelwood. So why didn't the crime lab or the Manitowoc Sheriff's uh, Clark destroy item W as they were legally required to do in 2003? Now begs the question, was this in fact illegal? And if not, where is the supporting documentation? In other words, are there additional documents uh, regarding the 2003 exoneration of Stephen Avery that we do not know about? All right, guys, that's the end of my presentation. My name is Dr. Silkman and I'm from the Foul Play team. If you haven't done so already, uh, please check out our YouTube channel as well as our website. And as you can see in our YouTube channel, we have a variety of uh, presentations done by uh, myself and various members of the Foul Play team. Uh, they're there, uh, available for you to listen and watch. And as you can see in the last presentation that was done entitled Cherie Cohane's 20 Year Obsession with Stephen Avery, um, this really is like a part two because now we have foiled the documents uh, and had a look at the uh, 2003 uh, DNA exoneration reports. And there's definitely some shenanigans going on uh, with Cherie Cohane in the crime lab. Thank you for listening, guys. God bless.